What's doing, everybody? Welcome to episode 736 of First Class Fatherhood. I'm happy and honored, as always, to be here with you guys. Thank you for tuning in. I got a tremendous guest for you guys today. Navy SEAL turned astronaut Chris Cassidy joins me on the podcast today. Such an honor uh, to talk to an American hero. Uh, Chris Cassidy graduated from BUDS, the uh, Navy SEAL training, back in the early 90s with BUDS Class 192. He was the honor man of his class. He would go on to serve 10 years as a frogman. He deployed four times, including twice to Afghanistan, the first time being just two weeks after the 9-11 attacks. He was the SEAL platoon commander at SEAL Team 3. He was also the platoon commander of SEAL Delivery Vehicle Team 2. Uh, so he has many, many accolades and awards, including a bronze star with the V device and another bronze star for combat leadership. After uh, his time with the Navy, where he left as a captain, he would move on to NASA, where he would become an astronaut. He was the 500th man in space. He spent 377 days in space. Uh, I mean, uh, unbelievable. I could go on and on about what Chris Cassidy has accomplished. He is currently the president and CEO of the Medal of Honor Museum. It's a big, big honor to have him on the podcast today. Uh, this guy is an All-American, and of course, he is a first-class father as well. So Chris Cassidy, U.S. Navy SEAL turned NASA astronaut, will be here with me in just a few minutes. So please stick around for the interview. And if you are interested in my Navy SEAL interviews that I do, I've had a ton of them on here. So go through the archives of First Class Fatherhood. You'll see my interview interviews with uh, frogmen such as Jocko Willink, the lone survivor, Marcus Luttrell, uh, Bin Laden killer, Rob O'Neill, and so many others. So please go through the list. Also, uh, a couple of other astronauts that have joined me on the podcast, including Victor Glover, who will be piloting the Artemis crew around the moon next year, and also Chris Hadfield. So go through the archives, check them all out. And uh, listen, do me a favor, help me spread the word about this podcast. I'm, I'm here on Rumble now, live going on Rumble. Follow the channel here on Rumble, and if you're listening on Apple or Spotify, please leave a rating or review, and please help me spread the word about this podcast to everybody, every father in your neighborhood or in your contact list. Let them know about the show that's here celebrating fatherhood and family life. You guys know it. Every day is Father's Day right here on the podcast, and here comes my interview straight up with Chris Cassidy on First Class Fatherhood. First Class Fatherhood, that is where Alec Lace comes in with his popular podcast. And one of the most interesting was on a podcast. Alec Lace interviews high-profile fathers from actors to NFL players with a vision to change the narrative of fatherhood and family life. All right, joining me now, First Class Father, Chris Cassidy. Welcome to First Class Fatherhood. Hey, Alec, great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Well, it's an honor to have you here. Let's start it like this. How many kids do you have? How old are they? So uh, I have... Three uh, of my old children, and then I remarried, and now have two two additional ones. So we've got five now, and they range from twenty three to twenty nine. Wow, wow, very cool! It, if you could, Chris, it, please hit my listeners with a little bit about your background and what you do. Yeah, so I retired from the, uh, from the Navy as a Navy captain a couple of years ago. Twenty eight years in the Navy, eleven of those in the beginning as a SEAL team guy, and then um, the last half, the last 17 years of that Navy time, I was an NASA astronaut, flew in space three three different times, I, once on a space shuttle and a couple times to the, uh, well, launching on a Russian Soyuz rocket to the International Space Station. I've been retired from the government, both NASA and the Navy, for a little over two years now, and now I'm working uh, with a team of people building a museum for Medal of Honor recipients. Yeah, thank you for your service, and what an incredible career, Chris, and I'll get a little bit more into that in just a second. So if you could, I know you said, uh, I think, you know, in the late 20s there, so I mean, if you could take me back to the beginning of your fatherhood journey, about how old were you when you became a dad, and where were you at in your career, and how did that experience kind of change your perspective on life? Yeah, that's a great, good, um, this is fun to talk about, because it's, it's one of those things you don't often think about now, later in life when your kids are grown up, and, and now I have a two-year-old uh, grandson, almost three-year-old grandson. So I was uh, 24 years old when my daughter was born. And so, and I uh, had just completed SEAL training, or I was one, maybe one year into my first SEAL team, uh, you know, done with training and, and doing the job. So it was a little bit different because a lot of my peers and, and, uh, and coworkers in the Navy and the teams at that age weren't married or certainly didn't have children if they were married and living a, a different weekend than than mine. Uh, I, I wasn't envious, or, but every now and then, 
you know, and they're hearing their stories on Monday, you're going, oh, okay, well, I didn't quite have quite the uh, crazy weekend you did or changing diapers and, and going to uh, the, you know, the zoo. Uh, it, but I, I, I wouldn't trade it for a second having kids early. I really enjoyed having my kids early in my age. And, uh, and it, particularly now, as a relatively younger uh, granddad, and with adult children, it's fun to be on on this side of it. But thinking back to those early early stages, like you don't know what you're getting yourself into, and you just kind of figure it out as as the days transpire, right? Yeah, and I'm right there with you too. We started having kids. We were tw- I have four kids. We started. We were 24, 25 years old. Same thing. And now, so as our, our oldest is uh, is 17, he'll be is be 18 next month. So I agree. I, I I enjoyed having them at that age. And and what I and for, uh, excuse me if you had said it, but what is the makeup of your kids? Because I know I always hear about the Frogman curse. So many of the seals I've had on the podcast here. A lot of them they bang out one girl after another. But what do you, what's the makeup for you? Yeah, right, right. So. My first uh, kid was a girl. My second kid was a girl. And then my son uh, was born. He was dash three. Um, but I was doing it. The, 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 the folklore is it has to do with the cold water. And my my first job in the SEAL team was driving underwater vehicles called SEAL SDVs, SEAL delivery vehicles. And you're in cold water all the time. And those two girls were a product of that job. <laughs> well, it, you know, it's got to be, I mean, you have obviously the, the coolest dad job that there really is. I mean, to say my dad is an astronaut or even, I mean, my dad is a Navy SEAL would be enough, but to have both of those together, what what is it kind of like, Chris? I mean, I've talked to a lot of different military guys, special forces guys that, you know, go on, um, you know, have to leave for deployment, leave the families behind, which I, I, I can't even begin to imagine, but it must be a completely different concept to say you're leaving your family, you're going out of this world, literally going into space here. So what, how do you kind of prepare with your family or what is that process like for you as a dad as a husband uh, when you're getting ready to leave the planet well the first thing is if you're starting that process when you're right about to leave the planet you're too late uh and nasa realizes that nasa a, does a really fantastic job of preparing not just the crew member for the technical part of the space but preparing the family for the intangible parts about six months of on the uh, on the space station and separation uh, and much like a military deployment, it, 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 your previous guest probably told you, when you're in the military, you're prior to leaving for a deployment, there's lots of short trips where you're going to training, you're gone for two weeks, and you're home for a couple of days, you're home for the weekend, gone for another month, home for three weeks, gone for a week. This kind of in and out, leading up to like a, a multi-month um, separation kind of deployment. And those little trips I'd have found they although they can be equally as trying but they do prepare the family well for what it's going to be and we do the same thing at NASA on the space station where where it's an international space station which means there's uh participants from Russia Japan Canada the European countries of course the United States and we traveled all those places uh but there there's a support network that they get to know our families they get to know our kids there's a child psychiatrist that if you're a want them to talk to that person, you know, and build a rapport before any bad times might happen. And then it's understanding risk, you know, that you're going to stand there, family, and watch your loved one ride on top of a ball of fire. And it's a tough experience to do, uh, even if it goes well, right? Like you're watching them just be a little bit higher than the fireball every second. Uh, so I don't know. I'm not really answering your question, but. It's something and you talk about as a family, what where what do you want to happen if it's a bad day? You know, that kind of thing. Um, tough conversations, but preparation is uh, so helpful in making making people understand that there's risk there. Did, did being uh, a Navy SEAL, did that kind of help you uh, with the astronaut process of getting, did it make it any easier maybe than the, than the other guys that were going in it with you, or going through the training, going through the whole process? Was it a little bit easier given your background as a frogman? Well, my family understood what a six-month deployment means. Doesn't, made, doesn't mean it was easier for them than others, but at least a lot of, a lot of anxiety and fear comes from unknown things, just like a kindergartner has absolute terror on in the car on the way to the first day of kindergarten, but you come back at lunchtime on day one and they're totally fine and happy and they got new friends because the unknown is gone. Uh, so 
that's that's the the big part of it is is uh, kind of getting those those unknown unknowns out and 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 the experiences in the military certainly help with that. You know, being away from your family, it, it just kind of sucks no matter what. And there's always some every deployment's different. Something breaks, the car doesn't work. It's a birthday that you missed. Your your uh, your whatever a wedding that they all experienced and you didn't. There, there's each one of them is uniquely different. Yeah, well said. And and so, uh, how about as far obviously uh, with your military background being a, in the NASA program? Obviously, you're very well disciplined as an individual. But what type of disciplinarian are you as a dad when the kids were growing up? And is that different than the discipline style that you grew up with? Uh, probably similar. I I I, I have to give myself probably a C for being super disciplined. Like I'm a little soft. And uh, and and don't love conflict. And uh, it, it, I think um, probably for me, just disappointment. I never wanted to be a kid that disappointed my parents. And I probably default to that same thing as a parent myself. Like, man, I'm just really disappointed that you made that decision. Uh, and rather than screaming and yelling, and uh, maybe there's time where I should get more fired up. But it's usually expressing disappointment or on the positive side extreme pride i'm so proud of you for for making that decision and or doing what you did or working so hard or getting that a whatever it is um uh, enforcing the, the pride and excitement and love how about as far as the top values you would say chris that you wanted to instill in all your kids growing up um just kind of always well, well, always given your um, your best, right? Like, no, I, I always wanted the, my kids to know that they uh, it's no problem to fail or to struggle with a class, but it is if you're blowing it off and you're not doing your part. But if if you're going to doing the homework, getting extra help from the teacher, and you still are struggling. There's not much else you can do. So just bring your in game to whatever you're doing, whether it's school, sports, being a brother or sister. Uh, that's kind of what's important to me. And you know what? Obviously, when I was a kid growing up, I remember like a lot of kids when you would ask them what they want to be when they grow up. It seemed like a lot more kids when I was growing up said astronaut than they do now. Uh, is and you know I don't know. It has the interest in young kids. Uh, maybe maybe you see it different because you're obviously this is your world. Uh, is it seem like the interest is at a higher level, at the same level, or at a less level right now as far as being interested in the space program? Well, I think we're on a little bit of an uptick right now. When I became an astronaut in 2004, we were still flying the space shuttle, but it was late in the space shuttle program. People were kind of used to it. They'd ever showed launches on TV, uh, and then. In 2011, we retired the space shuttle, the United States, and we were in this period of time where from 11 to 2020, where the only way to get to space with people was on a, to buy those services from the Russians. And in that time, I noticed a lot of, of uh, disinterest in the, in, uh, around the country about space. And, and many, many times people would say, we don't even have NASA anymore, right? Like, you guys don't even go to space. But... And it, 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 not digging that person. I'm just saying it, it wasn't as forefront. But then with the success of SpaceX and Blue Origin and Virgin, and, and Virgin Galactic and these commercial companies and well, people tuning into YouTube to watch live launches and to watch rocket casings come back and land on a barge off the coast of Florida, all of that, Alec, has gotten, I think, the public excited again. And we're in this really neat time where where space travel is exciting uh there's a number of reasons one we'll send government astronauts back to the moon here in some number of couple of years whatever that shakes out to be very soon though and then ultimately to mars the first mars walkers are probably in junior high right now they don't know who they are but that they they'll that's who will do it and that's that's really cool, I think. And so there's an uptick in excitement. 
Yeah, I know. It's definitely exciting for me. I did last year, or was it maybe two years ago now? I had Victor Glover on the podcast here, and he's now he's going to be the pilot, I believe, on the Artemis team that's going to do the flyby on the moon next year. And so, I, you know, for, for myself, I know that the interest is definitely elevated as, as, as maybe 15 years ago, my interest in it. So it's definitely uh, gotten bigger. And, and speaking of like guys like Victor, like how is it with the, the families of like your crew that goes uh, on the flight? Do you guys, are, are you very tight knit as far as your families, like your wives, your kids, or is that kind of keep kept all separately? And it's just you guys together, like when you're on a crew heading out into space. Oh, no, it's tight. It's tight. The astronaut's office itself is pretty small and tight knit both of the as the, as the the workers the the employee employees and the families the broader office when i became an astronaut in 2004 there was 120 astronauts when i retired in 2021 there were about 40 astronauts and um uh, and you know pretty much large percentage of people were married with children um uh, and and you know those group but then it's even a smaller tightness uh, a smaller circle of tightness with your your actual crew members that you are going to space with, and and those families uh, also bond because they're experiencing launch delays together. They're experiencing extensions of stay. You know, can't come home today because the weather's bad. You're going to be there another week. All of that they go through together. The nerves of standing on the top of a building in Kennedy Space Center. It, and you know, with all of the families like this, arm in arm and shoulder to shoulder, watching their loved ones leave the planet, uh, then those things bond you, and those bonds kind of last for forever. And my shuttle crew, two thousand nine, we there's seven of us, and 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 those families um, are still tight. You know, my kids were older than a couple of the other ones, and they babysat for the other crew members. So it's things like that that just make those connections really strong. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. There's not too many people you could talk to that have that kind of thing in, in common or an in interest. So it's got to be pretty cool for the kids uh, to talk about that. And I, I wanted to just mention to you real quick and talk about you're the president and CEO of the Medal of Honor Museum. A few years back when they first revealed the plans uh, to build that, I, I got invited to go to that out in Texas there. And um, uh, and it was one of the best experiences of my life. I was with all the Medal of Honor recipients, uh, a lot of them that I had interviewed on the show here, Michael Thornton and, and Matt Williams and guys like that. And so uh, I think it's so important what they're doing with the with, with the Medal of Honor Museum as far as preserving so much of this history for the young kids. And it's something that parents can take their kids to and give them a chance to experience the sacrifice that has been made on account of all of our freedom. So uh, tell me about the Medal of Honor Museum and, and what's going on with it. Yeah, thanks for asking. So since you were here with, when there was just an empty site, we have been under construction for two years. We broke ground in March of 2022. 20, uh, and, uh, and, and I'm pointing this way as if you can see it, but it's just right on the other side of the wall here is a construction site. The building is an amazing design that the, it's just, uh, this, uh, the exhibit deck is suspended in the air by five columns. Each column represents a military branch of service and the burden that it takes to carry the load of our nation's freedoms and and uh, and telling those stories is is going to be our our uh, kind of showcase because there's other museums and and attractions where you can go to learn about history or learn about World War II or learn about aviation or tanks. That's not this place. This museum will be a, a repository of stories, stories of normal people that did something something amazing and spectacular when the nation needed them to do it. So it's a biographical uh, uh, kind of storytelling uh, facility or museum. In addition to that, we'll have a leadership institute, which will be also be located and headquartered out of, out of uh, uh, our home here in Texas. But that's really the arm of which we can inspire the nation is through the, the, the transferring that those stories to other locations, having uh, programs and events throughout the country and here as well. And then a monument on the National Mall in D.C. is the third part of the of the program. So all of that, we're uh, we're working on it very hard. We'll open the museum's doors uh, one year from right now, March of twenty five. So we're getting close. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. I really love what you guys are doing. And I'll, I'll put a link down in the description below so people can check out what's going on with the museum uh, and, and, you know, transitioning it back in here to fatherhood for a second. 
Uh, I, I got to ask you because you have older kids. My, my my youngest is my only girl. She's nine years old. So I dread the whole dating scene that's approaching me at a rapid speed. It seems like you've been through this before. You know, you've already been down this road. Uh, I, I would imagine, you know, a Navy SEAL, it's a little easier when, when you don't like the daughter's boyfriend to kind of intimidate a little bit. But how did you kind of handle it or get through uh, when your kids became old enough to start hitting that dating scene, especially your daughters? Yeah, it's definitely a, a weird time for as a parent right because you still see your kid as this as the small little kid that you change your diapers or fed them or walked there held their hand with a backpack that was just as as big as their whole body and took them to school um it, it, and then now they they start dating and and then there's the aspect of, in your own head of i know how a 14 year old boy thinks and get that crap out of your head young man kind of thing uh but you know, at the end of the day, the I always thought the the qualities that uh, I try to make my kids see in their person that they'd be interested in would be qualities that I was I would be a cheerleader for them uh, if they found that that person. And, and usually, if if there wasn't a, it's not a right fit, it doesn't take long for that to be known to the kid. There might be some emotion and some tears or whatnot involved, but um, yeah, it's simply weird though when you when you see your, your kids start dating. What is it, what's the experience been like so far? I know you're, you're new into it, but what's the experience like been uh, being a grandparent so far? It's really cool, you know, the, the uh, I mean, we still change a diaper in, in, here and there, but it's it's not like, I, 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 I like the ability to, just have fun with the kid. You don't necessarily have to do all the discipline, although as a three-year-old, it's, it's pretty easy. It's like, don't touch that thing and stay here. Yeah, but then it's not discipline. It's just guardrails. Uh, but uh, it's a lot of the bud, and you just realize what a... Uh, looking at the world at a, with a three-year-old's eyes and the wonderment and excitement of everything they interact with, and you appreciate that more later in life than when, when you're in the throes of it as a 24 year old parent, you know, like, how am I going to get this kid fed me do my work that I still have to do and get some sleep? You know, you don't have that part of it. Yeah. I'm not looking forward to it anytime soon, but I am looking forward to it down the line for sure. Um, all right. So what do you have coming up here? Cause obviously you retired from the, uh, you know, the space, but do you still keep your kind of finger on the pulse there now? So you're doing anything contractor or what, what are you doing now? What kind of plans do you have for the future here? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the, the being the president of the Bell Army Museum is a full time job, and so that's kind of keeps me fully occupied. But I really do have a passion for space flight, and and I uh, um, I would definitely go back in a heartbeat if there if there was a right the right fit with a company that needs somebody like me with a certain experiences. I'd be all 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 over it. Um, uh, yeah, I, um, I I do a lot of public speaking now, which I enjoy sharing the experiences that I was so, so fortunate to have as a SEAL and as an astronaut and representing our country in, a, in an international way on the space station. Just very excited and honored that I could do those things. And so now it feels uh, like a fun way to give back is to share some of those tales and experiences and lessons learned in a, in a public speaking way. Yeah. Wow. Very cool. I know. I know. Johnny Kim is another one. Is there? Is it just you two that were seals and then astronauts? Or is there any more? No, I was actually the second one. The first one was a gentleman named Bill Shepard. He was. Oh. Uh, he was about twenty years my senior uh, at NASA, and he's the one that and he inspired me, mentored me, told me how you, what the forms are, who do you call to be to put in an application. I didn't know any of that stuff. I was not a kid growing up dreaming about being an astronaut. I just kind of stumbled into it as a possibility later in my career. Wow, well, very cool. All right. Uh, last thing I want to hit you with here, Chris, I love to ask all the dads that I get on the podcast, what type of advice do you have for that new dad or for that about-to-be father who's out there listening? <laughs> I, I, uh, less gear is better. Don't be the guy with so much gear that you've got you a burden yourself. A little umbrella, umbrella stroller. I always used to time myself. The time uh, I didn't. I thought of in and out of the parking lot was time on target. How fast can I get the kid in, strapped in, and the keys and ignition and rolling, uh, and made little fun games like that. And 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 eventually, my kids 
got into it too, where uh, I was all about efficiency in and out of the car uh, and, and making sure, oh, the other thing is, as early as you can, make them carry their own stuff. And I, 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 that dawned on me what time we went um, snow skiing. They were little. And, and I watched this one dad, and no disrespect to him, but he was carrying everything. And the other family members weren't carrying nothing. And, they're, and, and I realized, hey, it's for their own education if they learn that they got to carry their own stuff. And, uh, and so that's, I think, important. Carry your own gear. Yeah, I, I love that. I love the message. This has been an honor for me. Uh, I got to say, Chris Cassidy, you're a first class father all the way. And thank you so much for giving me a few minutes of your time today on First Class Fatherhood. Alec, thank you very much. Alec Lace has interviewed more than 700 dads on his award winning podcast, First Class Fatherhood. Dads from all walks of life, including Tom Brady, Deion Sanders, Matthew McConaughey, Steve Harvey, Tony Hawk, Eric Trump, and so many more. Find out why First Class Fatherhood has been number one on the iTunes charts. Who these men are as fathers and how they raise their children is far more important than anything they accomplish in their careers. Alec Lace encourages his high-profile guests to share their fatherhood journeys and offer advice to new and soon-to-be dads. Let every father in your contact list know about First Class Fatherhood. Available wherever you get your podcasts. Every day is Father's Day on First Class Fatherhood.